In this video, I'm restoring and modifying a family heirloom. I'm going to try to save or reuse as much of the original piece as possible while creating some modern additions and unique details. And I think you're going to love the end result. <laughs> This is a buffet and pie safe that's been in Amanda's family for a couple generations now. She's struggled with the idea of getting rid of it, even though it's not in the best shape anymore and is taking up space in the dining room that she'd like to use for a china cabinet. A couple weeks ago, she asked if I could restore it, but add a china cabinet on the top. We set it up on the bench and I started brainstorming. The first problem were the legs. They were three quarter inch by one and a half inch pine that had started to bow over the years. I knew it was pretty unlikely they were gonna hold the additional weight of what we were considering, and definitely not if it was full of fancy dishes. I started disassembling the piece and marking and labeling everything just in case. I still wasn't exactly sure how I was gonna pull this off. But when I started to remove this top, suddenly the ideas started to come into focus. I could build a frame for this whole piece to sit inside and then flip the existing top over to become the top of the new upper cabinet. And I had a pretty cool idea for something to do with this back piece as well, but more on that in a bit. Here's the guy that originally built this buffet, Amanda's grandfather. As the story goes, he'd seen a similar piece and decided to build one from memory using only a few basic hand tools. It turns out he made a habit of that, building things his family needed instead of buying them. That really resonated with me. As a young man, one of the prime motivations for me to learn to build things was so that I could build the expensive things I couldn't afford to buy. So hearing that story really motivated me to do this project justice, merging something old and something new to make something we can be proud to have in our dining room for years to come. I cut up some two by fours and cleaned them up using the joiner. You could do the same thing with a planer or table saw, but it's an easy and inexpensive way to get some good usable sticks for the legs. While I waited on the glue to dry, I disassembled the rest of the main cabinet that will sit inside the newly built frame. I got the legs out of the glue up and cleaned up all the edges on the joiner one more time. I was inspired to try some dusty lumber co type stuff with the joinery, but that went pretty poorly. So I ended up just cutting out the notch on the bandsaw and then cleaning it up with the chisel. I attached the front legs to the center support using recessed screws that I'll plug later with a dowel. Then I attached the side supports to the rear legs using only one nail each. This was so that it would loosely hold the shape while I sat the cabinet inside the legs, but would still be flexible enough to get things square all around. She decided she wanted the whole outside painted slate gray. So I sanded the stain off the outer edges before hoisting it onto its new legs. My finished nail tack welds held strong enough that I was able to squish that cabinet onto the base and get things squared up. These ratchet clamps held the legs square and level while I used the 15 gauge nailer to get them attached in discrete locations. That will hold everything in place enough to move it around until the top is secured. That gap you see there was on purpose and will be hidden with trim before the finish. I cut up a couple of 2x10s for the top so they'd have time to glue while I was working on the rest. Then got started on the trim and face frame. Return viewers may notice here that I finally got a 15 foot dust collection hookup for the sander and pocket hole jig, which is pretty dang convenient. I'll post the link in the description. While waiting to reclaim table space from the glue up, I trimmed out the sides in the same pattern as the original buffet, just a little wider. For some reason, I thought my planer was wider than it was. So when I realized the next morning that it wasn't by one half inch, I had to run the top through the drum sander to get things level. That little memory lapse cost me several hours of sanding. With the top prepped and ripped down to size, I started assembling the face frame. 
I was extra careful here with the inner dividers to make sure everything was nice and even on both sides. I secured the outer edge of the face frame first with clamps, then marked the exact location of the vertical dividers with a speed square, then ensured they were exactly the same on both sides for door and drawer symmetry. Once I was sure, I secured the center dividers, sanded it down, and installed the face frame with a pin nailer. I secured the top to the base using 3 inch screws directly into the legs. And this flush cut saw made clean cuts and short work of covering up those holes. Dead on 63 inches. I used the original buffet top to get the dimensions for the upper cabinet. With the addition of the legs on the perimeter of the base, this should work out perfectly for it to be a step down and line up at the top. I cut out the frame for the cabinet and drilled pocket holes so there would be no connections visible on the side. I oriented the holes so that the top ones would be covered by the old buffet top and the bottom ones would be up under the face frame in the recessed area under the cabinet. This made assembly super quick and easy. Pocket screws for the outside frame and I used finish nails to hold the center supports in place while I drilled out holes for screws. I got to thinking about the weight that would be on the center and the span across five feet and decided that screws would be a better choice to hold it all together long term. Here's where I made a decision that I regret and won't make again. I used a rabbit bit to cut a recess for the back panels. I had used this technique successfully on the doors for my record player cabinet, so I thought I could use the same thing here. But in the end, it caused me several issues and took a lot more work than if I just cut channels in the support structure and slid in panels. From now on, that's the only way I'll be doing the backs for larger cabinets. I used a red chestnut stain for the shelves and the inside walls of the cabinet to try and closely match the original colors. Using the pin nailer, I attached the face frame I pre-assembled with the same build process as the base cabinet. Then I lined up the old top on the new top and attached it with a finish nailer. This is one of my favorite parts of every project. When the main structure is built and you can really start to imagine the finished product and how it's going to fit into the space. What you see me doing here is measuring the door heights and widths. And on that notepad, I'm calculating the dimensions needed to account for the rail and style joint. What you don't see me doing here is botching that calculation by five and a half inches. But for the sake of chronological order, I'll get back to that because I didn't actually discover that mix up until I'd already finished the drawers. For those, it was pretty straightforward. I cut them all in half, essentially making four drawers out of two, then just cut down the width and reattached everything just as they were, only two inches smaller. The one caveat is that I added screws to the bottom for added strength, rather than just the original nails. As you can see here, I also built a frame that acted as a spacer to get the drawer slides lined up exactly where they needed to be. Easy breezy. Now, where was I? Oh yeah. Behind me, you can see I took the doors out of the clamps and they are decidedly too small. Turns out when I was working out the dimensions in my notebook earlier, I used a faulty calculation that took a little over five inches off of what it should have been. So as a result, all these doors are wrong and I get to do it again today. Well, nothing to it but to do it. Let's get after it. I triple checked my numbers this time, calculating down to an eighth inch gap all the way around and recut all the rails and styles. Even though this was inconvenient to have to do again and cost an extra 60 bucks in materials, it was actually good for me because every door I make gets better and better and I'm kind of starting to enjoy the process. Since this was the second time around, the shaper was already set up for styles. So I ran them all through first and cut the tongue portion. Then I swapped out the mill for the groove and ran the rails and the styles all through on one side. I glued up the bottom doors with a quarter inch plywood in the center and set them aside to dry. 
For the upper doors, we wanted a glass look, so I hit up our local plastics dealer and picked up a 4x8 sheet of clear acrylic. It was substantially cheaper than the big box doors. And while I was there, I snagged a replacement sheet of Sintra for my workbench. The acrylic cuts just fine with a regular saw blade, so I ripped the width on the table saw and was able to get all three pieces cut out on the miter saw. It looks brown here because it's covered in wax paper, which I'm going to leave until after the paint and clear coat is applied. I glued up the top doors using the same process. This is the first set of fully clear doors I've ever built, so something I wish I'd thought of was to paint the inside groove before assembly. It's not super noticeable as you'll see in the finished piece, but it's definitely something I'll want to address in future builds. For the drawer faces, I cut them on the miter saw and ripped them down to height on the table saw from probably the flattest and straightest board I've ever bought from the big box stores. I sanded the doors and drawer faces with my new six inch orbital sander. I gave in and picked this thing up after watching countless videos by numerous woodworkers. And I gotta say, it's lived up to the hype, especially with this sandpaper everybody's raving about. It's taken at least some of the sting out of sanding. Finally, it's ready for finish. She chose a color called Slate Tile, and after some discussion, told me just to paint the whole thing the same color. I bought this Valspar cabinet paint, and the dude told me it didn't need primer and could be sprayed from an HVLP gun. So I taped up all the openings and did just that. However, either I needed to adjust the flow on the HVLP gun, or this needed primer, because it went on pretty thin even with multiple coats, and we ended up doing a final coat with a roller later. You can see what I mean here, especially in the area just above the countertop. But before I went too much further, I wanted to make sure she liked the color and how things were shaping up. So I hung the doors and attached the drawer faces and asked her to come over and take a look. She did not like it. More specifically, she just didn't like that it was all blue. She wished that we had stained the countertop instead of painting the whole thing. Now I know that that is a lot of extra work to fix. But I did what I had to do. Jokes aside, she was absolutely right. After sanding it down, applying some pre-stain, and then staining it with dark walnut, it really brought the whole piece alive. It looked so much better, and she was happy to help. Mostly. I added some lights and got all the shelves I'd stained earlier trimmed down to allow light to pass by. Then, it was time to spray the clear coat. I'm using General Finish's High Performance Gloss for this, and since I was curious earlier if the flow control had anything to do with how the paint turned out, I cranked it up just a hair for the clear, and boy, oh boy, did that fix it. One coat, and this thing already looked amazing. Because of my last name, and that we keep bees on our farm, people often buy us bee-related gifts. One of my best friends and mentors bought us these bee cabinet pools a while back, and we were waiting for the right project to use them on. This was it. There weren't enough of them, so we had the idea to use flowers for the drawer pools, and it worked out perfectly. I also added these wine and martini glass racks for extra storage and easy access for when we have dinner guests. And that decorative piece I took from the original top back at the beginning of the video? Well, I used it to make a picture frame, in which I placed one of her favorite pictures of her grandfather. I had a lot of fun with this one, and we love how it turned out. And as always, I learned a lot that I can take into future projects on what worked and what didn't. And I hope you learned something too. Check out the description for links to tools and materials used in the video, along with social media links for additional content and updates. And when the time is right, consider supporting my Patreon as I build out what that's going to look like going forward for subscribers. Thanks so much for watching. If mama ain't happy, she can sand it herself.